So again, my goal is to keep introductions brief so we can uh, learn from uh, the wisdom of our panelists. So with that, I will introduce our moderator and commentator for this next panel, uh, which is Dr. Lisa Iazzoni. She is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's the director of the Mongan Institute for Health Policy uh, at MGH. Um, if you look at her bio, you will see that she has been amazingly productive during her academic career. Uh, she's been well-funded by government and by foundations. Uh, she's um, well-published, um, but more importantly, she continues to give back uh, to the community uh, by serving on the board of directors for the Boston Center for Independent Living. Uh, she has been recognized by her peers um, and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Ayazani. Thank you so much. I, we're at that transition where you don't really know what kind of clothing you should be wearing, so sorry that I'm kind of taking off my coat right now. Okay, so we've got um, three of us, and um, we are going to start by um, me introducing each of my two colleagues on the table, then um, each of them will give their comments, then I will comment on their comments, and then we'll open it for questions. Okay, we figured that that was probably the best way to do this. Okay, so to my distant right is Dr. M Nicole Maswi. Um, she's um, in the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Faculty at Harvard Medical School and co-directs the Traumatic Brain Injury Fellowship Program at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. She received fellowship training in neurologic rehabilitation at Spalding Rehab and at the Massachusetts General Hospital and serves there now as the first ever dedicated consult physiatrist in the MGH Neurologic Intensive Care Unit. She's a neurotrauma consultant for the National Football League, and in her free time, she volunteers for the Boston Ballet Company as an in-house physician. Okay, and John, who I know well, so I shouldn't need my notes. Um, John is the executive director of the Massachusetts Disability Policy Consortium in Malden, Massachusetts. Um, this is a cross-disability advocacy and research organization. Um, he spent more than 30 years building coalitions of persons with a wide variety of disabilities to bring about this policy change and to empower his community, working both in the private and public sectors. He has served on the board of directors of more than 20 or a dozen nonprofit organizations. Mr. Winsky has testified before Congress on the Americans with Disabilities Act and special education. And so, Dr. Mazui. Oh, slides. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I um, am privileged to be here, and thanks to Dr. Slocum for the invitation. Just to give a little bit of background, so I am a clinician, and I work both at Spalding Rehab Hospital, I have a neuro recovery clinic there, essentially, where I have been treating patients with brain injury, spinal cord injury, and stroke, primarily some other uh, uh, neurologic uh, diseases, multiple sclerosis, um, really sort of spanning all neurologic disorders. And I have been doing that for about eight years now. I also, as Dr. Izoni said, I'm a consultant in the neurointensive care unit, so I have a fairly unique opportunity to start with patients when they are in first diagnosed uh, in the most sort of critical uh, periods of their acute care in the neurointensive care unit, and then I follow them usually all the way into their acute rehab stay and then beyond into the sort of chronic phase of recovery in clinic. So I get to see quite a spectrum of um, the disease and the recovery process. So that's where I'm, I'm speaking from. I am not a politician, I'm, I'm not involved in, in policy directly, but I'll speak to you from a clinical perspective uh, in terms of my experiences and um, what I understand to be the challenges uh, for healthcare delivery for um, the uh, patients in the neurologic uh, population. Did I do that right? Oh, oh there we go. Okay. Oh, that did not work. Now it's working. Okay. So, uh, so I consider, I'll spend a few minutes on this slide and then 
go through the others a bit quicker, but I consider the uh, barriers to healthcare delivery, that's in part what I was asked to speak on, I, I sort of group them into three categories, and those are patient-based barriers, um, clinician-based barriers, and then systems or facility-based barriers. And I think it's important that we talk about all of these and acknowledge all of these uh, categorically, but understanding that there's a great deal of overlap uh, as well. The, um, I, I think honestly practicing medicine in this day and age is rife with barriers, um, as, as any of you who are actively sort of practicing can appreciate. Um, these, these barriers, these obstacles are even higher. They are even more difficult to surmount for patients uh, with disabilities, for people with disabilities. And um, I see that every week, honestly. Um, I'll talk a little bit about transportation and communication. So I have patients that come from all over the region, all over New England, and sometimes, you know, take hours to get to an appointment to see me. And frankly, getting to that appointment takes days or weeks of planning. Um, and you know, I've got practice, I've got experience with them, but they are then going back to, and this is no, no disrespect to primary care uh, physicians and internists, but they're going back into communities and they are dealing with uh, primary care doctors who uh, have difficulty communicating. I have. I have patients who are aphasic or who have language uh, impairment. I have patients with cognitive impairment. Um, I have patients who are completely locked in and communicate using eye gaze devices only. And you can imagine the challenges in communicating with your local primary care doctor with those kinds of uh, barriers, I should say, or challenges, uh, impairments to, to overcome. So uh, these are things that First, we have to acknowledge exist, and we have to acknowledge our own limitations as clinicians uh, in, in the ability to address these uh, things. And, um, and, and I think for clinicians also, you know, you know we, we, we all have bias. Everyone, everyone has bias of some sort or the other, but you know, I'm in a unique and very fortunate position where I, I work with patients uh, with neurologic disorders every single day. This is my bread and butter and this is what I'm used to, but there are, there's a lot of stigma out there um, about patients and stigma within the medical community as well. And our keynote speaker addressed uh, that. Um, a, a lot of physicians and clinicians, they, they just don't know. They don't know how to deal with these patients. As the keynote speaker said, getting, even getting the patient on the examination table. So I'll have patients that come in and they haven't had a thorough physical exam because there's no Hoyer lift in the room uh, where, where they're going for primary care or for their cardiac appointment or any number of things, dermatology. Yeah. And, and so even, even getting basic care um, is, is really a challenge. And you know, I, I find it, I consider it my job to reach out to those clinicians and say, listen, this is what I'm concerned about for this patient, and this is how we can work together to meet his or her needs. Um, but it's really challenging, and, and as has been mentioned, there are clinicians out there that just don't feel like they can be bothered, because it's a lot of work. It takes time. I'm always running late uh, in clinic, because it takes more time. And in our current system, with the insurance barriers and the crunch to see 50,000 patients in a day, um, you, you really Something, something's got to give. And so I actually told my practice manager in the clinic the other week, I said, well, I'm late. I'm going to be late. And, you know, maybe this just isn't for me. If you guys can't deal with this, maybe it's just not for me. Maybe I just don't, maybe I just shut, the, shut it down. I really said that. I was just I was so frustrated. Uh, and I think educating within the medical community is priority one. Um, we have to teach ourselves about the challenges and the limitations that we face, and we have to figure out ways to work around that to serve all of our patients better. Um, one thing that's become increasingly frustrating is, is access to care for patients who need long-term services. And you know, I have patients after brain injury, young patients, and they, their recovery period is multiple years. It takes multiple years for these patients to recover. But if they run out of insurance coverage for physical therapy or occupational therapy eight months, eight months out of the gate, then what do you do? 
if the facilities that serve these patients for long term are closing down year after year after year, which is what we're seeing even in the short time I've been here, then what, what do we do? Um, so those are, those are some of the barriers um, that I see. I think what I can influence is educating my colleagues um, and making sure to continue to advocate within my own system that we uh, remember always to have accessible medical equipment, for example. You know, is our, is our, waste, is our, um, is our wheelchair weighing station working and ready uh, and accessible for everyone to use? Can we get these patients in and out um, in a way that doesn't clog up their entire day just because they come in on a stretcher? Uh, and keeping those things in mind, keeping that conversation going and not taking these things for granted And I think a picture says a thousand words. So, um, you know, I, we're in Boston and we're very lucky and we've got this really dense, dense concentration of medical experts and devices and cutting edge technology. But, you know, I have patients that are coming from rural Massachusetts or somewhere out in Maine or Vermont or New Hampshire. Uh, and for them to get emergency services, is a challenge, much, much, much uh, more of a challenge for them to get quality, uh, specialized rehabilitative care. So I think, I think remembering again that um, when we talk about equal access and leveling the playing field, some of these people don't have any choices right now. It's very hard to get a specialist to go out into a rural community, and that's not something that we face only in the United States, but Canada actually what you think is it's socialized, everybody's got equal access. Well, they even have trouble getting clinicians and specialists to go out into uh, the rural areas. So, so a picture says a thousand words. For uh, rehab medicine in particular, community integrate, reintegration, that's our main focus uh, in many cases. So that's, that's at the end of the day, we, we strive to reintegrate people back into uh, their communities back into getting them getting into the things that they enjoy uh, and and identify with and I was going looking across some data recently and I actually found it really interesting and I, again I think this is something that uh, is 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 missing largely a, a gap that we need to fill in um, in practice and it's that uh, the data shows us that physical limitations in the neuro population uh, account for actually less than you might expect in terms of barriers to getting back uh, and, and uh, reintegrating into the community. That actually affective and cognitive conditions are, can be in some cases stronger predictors of success uh, and successful reintegration back into one's environment. And if you can imagine the limitations we have with psychiatric care in the uh, general population, even more so, again, in the population of patients with disability. Uh, so one thing I, I'm, I am looking forward to is pushing and advocating for mental health services uh, for these populations uh, in particular. Uh, because again, I think it's another, another aspect where we are really kind of missing the boat here. Um, and it is really key to community reintegration, as was mentioned, you know, people, you can tell someone about it, but if you can't actually meet them where they are, uh, it uh, is often not, not very helpful. Along the lines of reintegration, um, what I think we have a lot of fun with is facilitating ways uh, to help people see themselves in their prior hobbies. Adaptive sports is just one way, but it's encouraging because I have patients that say, you know, doc, when can I get back to golfing? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to tell them, listen, if there's a sport that you can think of, I'm pretty sure we can adapt it. And uh, Spalding has an, an extraordinary adaptive sports program. Uh, a lot of brain injury comes with physical limitations. Stroke obviously comes with physical limitations. Spinal cord injury. Um, but, uh, but you know, reintegrating people back into their hobbies as well, uh, I find is a very important part of what we do, what we should be doing better, actually, and, uh, and really encouraging people. I've had to beg some of my patients to try the adaptive sports programs. And when they do, uh, it's really gratifying. Uh, but again, if you don't know it's out there, if the, your primary care doctor or your ob gyn doctor or your, your kid's pediatrician doesn't know those things are out there, then they may as well not exist uh, at all. Uh, another 
uh, very important um, um, aspect of what I do is patient education. Um, this, this study was done not too long ago, sorry, uh, not too long ago for stroke survivors. And I just found it really interesting that when you're looking at where patients get their information, well, they're, they're getting them from, from us. They're getting them from healthcare professionals. We think that there's this you know, wealth of information out there, but patients really rely on us for education. So um, going, again, meeting those patients where they are, going out into the communities, particularly underserved communities where there is a history of not trusting the medical system as well. Um, you know, there are opportunities to go to churches and community centers, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Patient education has come a long way, and I think we're doing better, honestly. Um, we have things like the Mass Rehab Commission, we have the BCIL, we have uh, ADAPT, and these are, these are programs and environments where patients can um, become involved, learn more about how to advocate for themselves, uh, and surround themselves with people that are facing some of the same challenges. My job as a clinician is uh, to be sure that I'm teaching the families as well as the patients. I invite the families to come into these clinic visits uh, so that they can be better informed about what we're expecting uh, down the road and how they can help because sometimes families feel very helpless. Uh, and again, Spalding has some extraordinary outreach programs that are open citywide for patients and their families and the community in general to learn about uh, ongoing rehab resources and uh, ways to uh, take the education you learn back into your own communities, uh, no matter how remote uh, they are. I personally have been involved in a few of the organizations. There is uh, the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, there's the Joe Nikiro Foundation, there's Home Base, uh, which addresses veterans who have suffered brain injury. Uh, this clip is from um, a webinar I did for the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. And this is a webinar that people all over the country were able to uh, log into and then act, ask questions interactively. And I've had patients contact me far down uh, the road. But these are some of the things, again, where we can meet patients where they are. All they need is a computer uh, to, to get involved in these kinds of things. So, um, so there are many, many opportunities out there. And one thing that I personally uh, have, a, have a real passion for is concussion education. So, I'm a I'm neurotrauma consultant for the NFL. I'm out on the sideline uh, evaluating patients. And you know, I, th I thought to myself, well, 70% of the NFL is African American. Most of those, I'll call them kids because they are, most of those kids actually come from um, low sort of socioeconomic um, strata, essentially. So they are coming from houses uh, homes where there is not much privilege, okay? They're coming from poor homes, they're coming from places that are not, uh, where the parents are not as educated. The kids don't have the opportunity to have uh, the best educations all the time. So, you know, they're coming from a disadvantaged point. And um, for many of these kids, they don't have the medical literacy because their parents don't have the medical literacy. And uh, I was the chairperson for the diversity, uh, gender and diversity committee at Spalding. And in this position, I developed a concussion education program for the Boston Public School System, uh, where um, I get a chance to go into the school systems uh, directly to educate these kids and their coaches, frankly, about the risks of concussion, how to identify it, and then what do you do once you suspect, how do we manage it? So that it's not a scary thing, um, but the awareness is there, because I think it's my job to protect their brains, frankly. Uh, and that starts now. We know now the data shows us that people, uh, that, that, that the young boys and young girls even, and playing with these sports can have lasting impact, uh, even playing at the high school level, certainly playing in the coll collegiate level, but even in the high school level. So uh, again, reaching out uh, into going into these communities, meeting people where they are, leveling the playing field in terms of education uh, is something that I have been um, fairly passionate about. And I'll close uh, with um, a bit about uh, education for the, the next generation of physicians. So I'm the co-director of the Brain Injury Medicine Fellowship and also the Neuro Recovery Fellowship, which is a research fellowship at MGH. And um, in, in my role there, I have the privilege and the opportunity 
to educate this next generation of uh, neurologists and physiatrists going out to take care of these patients. Um, I think that the future is really bright because awareness is increasing, frankly, and I think with that increase in awareness also comes with um, a, a better ability to address the changes that, uh, that need to be made. You cannot change what you do not know. Uh, and so I take it upon myself. I don't, we don't have as much fun as these guys, but, um, but I take it upon myself to uh, really try to inform the, the residents, the fellows, about the challenges we're facing, not to be uh, afraid of stepping up to those challenges, going out into their communities, uh, and partnering with other clinicians and other specialties. And, uh, and that's it, actually. So thank you for your time. Thank you. That was perfect. Thank you. All right. We'll wait questions for Dr. Mosby until after. Thank you. Sean. Hello. Uh, my name is Sean Winsky, and it's a pleasure to be here today. As the non-physician uh, in the room, I want to talk today about what we do, the work I do, a little bit about myself, and then um, what I see in medicine and where I think we need to go. So I'm the Executive Director of Disability Policy Consortium. Uh, we primarily do advocacy for people with disabilities. We also have just been awarded a uh, four-year grant um, from the state of Massachusetts to serve as the ombudsperson for people on mass health in several programs um, that have disabilities. So we will work with providers, insurance, mass health, and the consumer, obviously, to find solutions to problems when they occur. The fact that I'm here today is in some ways remarkable in that up until a few years ago, when you brought up medicine and medical care to people like myself with long-term disabilities, we would run screaming in the opposite direction. I have once told my staff, actually more than once, that it's never a mass casualty send me anywhere but the hospital. Because we must admit that our system is biased against people with disabilities. And there is a mass casualty. People like myself are going to be the last damn people in the room to get care. And then that partly because the value of our lives is minimized. And often leading that charge is medicine. And that's a horrible thing to say, but it is the God's honest truth. The purpose of the coalition is to bring the voices together of people with a wide variety of disabilities because as a singular group, whether it's people who are blind, visually impaired, people with cognitive disabilities, together they have very little voice and no money. Together, they stand at least a fighting chance of helping each other out and sending our voices together. And as healthcare has shifted over the last 10 years, we have become increasingly involved in healthcare issues and our advocacy. And it is, in fact, the predominant issue that we deal with. We must recognize, unfortunately, that we are back in an era of big institutions, the big hospitals, the big insurance companies, the bigger you are, the more power you have. And unfortunately, that is going to lead to decreased power for the consumer. Unless we all 
bring back the humanism to healthcare and to see our patients and the people we serve as people first. So let me talk about one moment about myself. I'm 55 years old. I'm a very uh, fairly rare form of muscular dystrophy called Chateau Marie II. I wear bilateral hearing aids. If you say to me, how are you, physically, I will talk about the old white man diseases like statins and urinating and the things that normal white 55-year-old males are going through who have eaten a little too much and need to watch their health. I will not talk about my hearing or my physical disability. I'm healthy right now. Last week when I had a neurovirus, I was not healthy. So you have to understand that for people with disabilities, this is baseline zero. One of the real struggles we're going through and Lisa has been one of the primary people behind this, is how do you measure the health of people with disabilities? Because if you look at the normal metrics that we use in healthcare today, we aren't even talking the same conversation. My blood sugar levels, they're important. My heart rate, it's important. But far more important to people with disabilities are the long-term support services, the durable medical equipment. If my personal care attendant doesn't come through that door at 8 o'clock this morning, she'll be slept. I'm not here at 10 o'clock in the morning. I can have the best medical care in the world. My life depends on somebody making $14 an hour and no benefits. They are far more important to me than any medical care will ever be. But unfortunately for most of us, our care is under the rubric of medicine. We have been shoved there because no one else knew what to do with us when they set up funding. They had Medicaid funding. Oh, well, we'll use Medicaid to serve these people because when we had them in institutions, that's where the money was. So now that people with disabilities are out in the community, we'll use medical funds to take care of them. But the system wasn't designed for us living in the community. We also have to have a conversation about the models that we're operating under. The medical model, which is the model of healing, of making better, of restoring. While that will work, Dr. Mazi's patients who have acquired a disability, for someone like myself who was born with a disability, this is who I am. You're not going to change me. You're not going to heal me. And that leads to these oddball situations. I fell out of my wheelchair about 12 years ago and broke my hip. I was in the hospital here at Boston Medical Center, down the road, I'm sorry. And it came time after my surgery to rehabilitate. And for me, that meant getting back to 15 and 16 hour days of sitting up in my chair 
and working full time. But when it came time for me to go to rehab, no one would take me. They said, well, you used a Hoya lift before to get into bed. You're going to use a Hoya lift now. You used PCAs to get you into bed or bathe you. You're going to do that now so we can send you home. But in fact, I was only going to be up two hours at a time in the beginning and then four hours and then six hours and eight hours. I wound up in Boston Medical Center for 11 days. Most of the days I'd be down in the cafeteria reading the newspaper or doing paperwork for my work simply because there was nowhere for me to go. We were wasting valuable resources at a top flight hospital so I could sit up a few hours a day. And we were ducking insurance the whole time. We also have to realize that some of the worst stigmatization from people with disabilities comes in the hospital and in medical care. One year ago, I went to Boston Medical Center with kidney stones. They hurt. <clears throat> and my PCA came in and they said to my PCA, he looks really clean, he looks really good. Skin is wonderful. You send him to a day program during the day suddenly not talking to me, but talking to the person who delivers my care. And she looked at the nurse and said, excuse me. And the nurse said, well, you must go to a day program, right, to keep them occupied during the day. And she said, I, actually, he runs a million dollar nonprofit organization with 12 employees. Oh. And that ended the conversation. Similarly, about 10 years ago, my wife at that time was in a wheelchair, got hit by a car, brought her into Mass General Hospital, had broken legs, had cerebral palsy. So I meet the surgeon, and he says, well, we can either let the legs heal naturally in a cast, a week in his surgery. And they said, well, doctor, she has cerebral palsy. He said, so? He said, so she has spasms. Her legs aren't going to set if you put them in a cast. And she's in a lot of pain right now. He said, well, we've given her pain meds. And I said, yeah, but you didn't give her anything for the spasms. So no matter what the pain meds. You're not helping her. I said, here's the phone number of her doctor. He said, is your doctor a surgeon? And no, a doctor is somebody who specializes in people with disability. He said, well, I don't want to talk to anyone unless they're a surgeon. The next day, I go to her room. Now, she graduated college with a 3.7. And he said, they were just here on rounds. I said, oh. He said, yeah, I told him I was still in pain. And she had one of those pain pumps where you push the button. And he said, the doctor told somebody maybe I didn't know how to push the button. These are real stories. How do we make things? We make change by meeting people where they're at. We make change by holding honest conversation that says, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your life. Give me the five minutes spiel. What's your day like? What do I need to know about your disability and the care I'm about to deliver? 
tell me about you. And we also need to work together because we're under attack. The funding that saved my life, Medicaid is under incredible attack. We all need to step up and say that medical care, health care, is a fundamental value in this country. And therefore, we must fund it. We have a war. The war is here. The war is here, and it's against poor people. It's against those who lack the resources. Our job is to start grabbing those boxes and moving them around. And yes, taking boxes from some people and telling them, you have enough boxes for the next 10 years. You have enough boxes for your children's 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 children. And over here are people who don't even have a bag. Thank you. I knew John was going to nail it, and John always nails it. And thank you, Dr. Masri. Um, oh my gosh, how do I follow that one? So I, I only have two minutes, though, um, that I'm supposed to comment in. And so I just wanted to reflect on the title of our session, which is Policy and Education, um, and ask whether hearts and minds can be changed by policy and education. Um, because in fact, what we've heard in all three talks this morning so far is that a lot of where the problems are is in hearts and minds. Um, you know, changing what people think, where they're coming from, who they see when they look at John and me. Um, and so, uh, one of the speakers, uh, or one of the commenters this morning when asked about whether people are equal, kind of invoked law. And in fact, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act does require equality. Um, one of the things that you might not know is that the Rehab Act of 1973, which predated the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was signed on July 26th of 1990, was the equivalent of the ADA, except only for federal institutions um, or federally funded programs. And the government refused to implement the regulations around Section 504 for many, many years. And in fact, one of the comments that they made was, you know, why don't we just make separate but equal facilities for people with disabilities? Uh, Whoa, um, that kind of language tells you something. And the whole point of the ADA was no, it's not separate but equal that we want, it's equal that we want. And so, um, so, but it's already been obvious through the talks this morning that along the social determinants of health that we in healthcare, um, education, and medical schools learn about all the time, people with disabilities are disadvantaged in every possible way. I think you talked about transportation, Nicole, and, um, and housing. We have to talk about housing, I think, is probably one of the leading disadvantages that we have. Education, income, employment. But the ADA is there. It's still there. I'm not sure, John, it would be great to get your perspective on this, whether it's hanging by a thread in some ways. Um, but um, I think our first speaker was a beneficiary of the ADA. Would you say that you are a beneficiary of the ADA? Um, yes, because I, I am a pre-ADA person. Um, I started Harvard Medical School on September 8th of 1980. Um, at that point, I'd had four years of symptoms that had come and had gone and had been weird and strange, and they would come and go, and I was 22, and I would say, I'm invincible, nothing's wrong with me, so I didn't get any kind of uh, evaluation for what was going on, but when I started at medical school, I started doing things like bumping into trees when I'd be walking along or kind of hitting cars when I'd be trying to go straight. And at that point, I realized that I actually did need to see a doctor. And at the end of my first semester at HMS, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. 
Fast forward, I could tell you stories for hours here that I will not bore you with right now, but I will fast forward to, um, to the summer of 83 when I was going to apply for internships and residencies. And again, remember, the ADA passed in 1990. So this was seven years beforehand. On the summer of 83, my intern advisor told me that the powers that be at Harvard Medical School, although I'd completed all the classes and done okay, um, had decided in their infinite wisdom that they were not going to write a letter of recommendation for me to apply for internship or residency. Because of that, I could not actually apply for internship or residency. What they said they would do would be to pass the hats to medicine programs at the academic medical centers affiliated with the Harvard Medical School, and they would see if they could come up with a salary for me. And they'd done that. And they come up with a salary, oh, this was going to be for a non-board eligible position. Okay, so they would let me do this position, but it wouldn't be board eligible. So they pass the hat, and they come up with a salary of $3,000 a year. And at that time, starting intern salary was 26. I could not actually afford to live on $3,000 a year. And so I've learned from the, my lawyer friends that this is what's called constructive dismissal. That they don't outright fire you, but they make your life so miserable that you kind of slink away quietly and just kind of get out of their faces and out of their hair. I don't think that would happen now. Joan, you can assure me that that would not happen now at Harvard Medical School, yes. However, I do think that a medical student with a disability may experience subtle kind of indications that the question is, as you said during your speech, that, or it wasn't a non-speech, it was a conversation, that, um, that you have to do 10 times as well to make people even believe that you could do as well. And I tell the story that I'm about to tell with permission of the late Charlie McCabe. And some of you in this room know that Charlie McCabe was a beloved figure at Harvard Medical School as an educator. But what you might not know is that when he was about to be chief medical resident, chief surgical resident, sorry, surgical resident at the MGH, which at that time, back in the early 80s, was equivalent to be, being anointed God, okay? He was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and he could not actually do his chief surgical residency. And so from his wheelchair, he taught the students in the emergency department. So I knew about Dr. McCabe, and my last ditch effort before I said, okay, I'm not gonna be able to apply for an internship or residency, was to go to Dr. McCabe and ask his advice. And this story is more about him than it is about me. Because he said to me, look, if there's anything else that you can do you should do it because they will never ever believe as a disabled person that you're competent to be a doctor. I hope that would be different now and I think that is different now in many ways but I think it's still out there. I think there's still gonna be that questioning at times out there. Let me finish my talk by saying that um, Dr. Masri was talking about um, about accessible tables and diagnostic equipment. Actually, slipped into the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was Section 4203, which was supposed to have the United States set standards for what makes medical diagnostic equipment accessible. Because what the ADA did was set up accessibility standards for buildings, for fixed structures, and things that are attached to fixed structures, like toilets and grab bars. But it didn't set standards for equipment. Furniture. Equipment is considered furniture. And so I actually chaired the committee. It was, it was really a challenging committee to chair because we had Paralyzed Veterans of America and General Electric that makes MRI scanners in the same room trying to agree. Let me put it this way. There was not agreement on one thing. We had hours and hours and hours of debate as to whether a table should lower to 17 versus 19 inches off the floor. And they never did actually reach consensus about this. But on January 7th, 2017, and note that date, the final regulations came out about what makes medical diagnostic equipment accessible. The next thing that was supposed to happen was that the Department of Justice 
was supposed to do scoping regulations. And what those basically are is telling healthcare delivery systems <clears throat> who has to have accessible diagnostic equipment. For example, if you have 20 clinic rooms, do you need an adjustable height exam table in two of them? So that was what was supposed to happen next. On December 26, the day after Christmas 2017, the Jeff Sessions Department of Justice rescinded rulemaking for accessible medical diagnostic equipment. And so they are no longer going to set rules for where we have to install accessible medical diagnostic equipment and who has to have that. So I think we have the laws, we have standards in place, but I'm just still not sure that we have the entire societal will. And we'll talk about the financing because John was so powerful about that. I'm just not sure we have the societal will to as yet make healthcare entirely accessible to people with disability. Okay, thank you. Okay, I was gonna sit back and just relax, but actually no, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on duty here. And you're gonna tell me when our session's almost up, right? Yes. We have two minutes, oh my God. Okay, we have two minutes. Does anybody have a two minute question? Five minutes, okay, we now have five minutes. Okay, going once, going twice. Oh, can't get more than five. Okay, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Carolyn Langer. I'm an instructor at the School of Public Health, but like many people here, I wear many hats. I'm also the parent of a young adult with autism and intellectual disabilities. Um, my question, which um, has come out uh, in all the sessions is, um, how do we ensure that we are making more room in pre-medical and medical curriculums to educate students about disabilities, especially where there are already so many requirements and now on top of the basic curriculum, we have to squeeze in opioids and end-of-life care and health policy. Uh, so I hope throughout the day we'll, we'll get some ideas on how to address this issue. We haven't figured that out yet at Harvard Medical School. I, I will say that with a certainty. We haven't figured it out. Um, there are other medical schools that do do a better job. For example, the family medicine program at Tufts actually has standardized patients who come and, in their wheelchairs and are there because they've got a back problem. But then when the medical student, unaware, starts talking to them about how is your back problem a problem for you, they start talking about what it's like when they have sex. And the students are like, oh my god, this person in a wheelchair has sex. How can I even possibly think about this? You know, but we haven't yet figured that out here. And my feeling is that the, that the way that we teach medicine here at Harvard Medical School is by cases. That if a case has something to do with a person's ability to get on in life, that's disability, and we should be talking about that. Do you have some suggestions? We at, um, there's Dr. Uh, Dorothy Tolton Weiss. She has, she's actually a graduate of the Spalding Rehab Program, the residency program, and she actually went on to train in palliative care, but she's been largely involved at HMS. She's a graduate of HMS as well, and she's been involved in increasing uh, interest in rotating at Spalding, actually. Uh, yeah, we there was a push actually to to get some required uh, training at uh, at Spalding for the for the HMS students. This was some years ago, but it didn't didn't go very far. Uh, we'll still work on that. But she's actually been involved, so we are now seeing more students come through HMS to rotate to sort of see what is what happens behind the walls of the rehabilitation hospital. That's just sort of a tiny glimpse into this world of, of caring for patients or persons with disabilities. But um, I, I went to medical school at the Mayo Clinic, and we and the, it's a required part of the curriculum, actually. And it's actually how I just I didn't even know what physiatry was. It was how I was introduced to physiatry was through this required rotation. So I'm hoping that as we move toward increasing awareness from an academic standpoint, that more medical school sort of follow in Mayo's uh, footsteps. And we're, we're trying to do our little part at least by increasing awareness and getting more students in because the word of mouth um, effect is actually quite strong. We have two minutes left and I actually, actually wanted... 
Can I just finish yeah. up that thought? Um, oh, sorry. I, I just, my own personal opinion is that we have to infuse this throughout the pre-medical and mm -hmm. medical education. Mm -hmm. And um, Tufts, I, I'm aware, has uh, that disability rotation. Right. UMass mm -hmm. Medical School offers a one-day disability workshop. I'm not sure there's any one single magic bullet. Um, yeah. My colleague, Maura Sullivan, is here from the ARC. And uh, mm -hmm. she operates, runs a Operation House Call, which is a wonderful program. I actually, and I know this is somewhat of a shameless infomercial, um, just got funded to start an innovative gap year program for pre-health profession students uh, after, their, after they graduate from college to spend a year in the greater Boston area working with disabled populations. Uh, but again, I don't think there is any one single magic bullet, so I, I applaud all of your efforts. Okay. We have two minutes. Does somebody have a question for John? I have a question can, for John. I can add yeah. one yeah. on that. Oh. Um, I think one of my hopes is as more doctors begin to see more people with disabilities, um, I hope that, and maybe this is weird, but it would seem to me in these big medical homes that we're talking about founding um, in ACOs and uh, accountable care organizations is that offices would have one of their physicians work with the families that have people with disabilities so that the practices would see the need in the community and communicate that to the medical schools as well. You know, hey, we're seeing more people with disabilities out here we didn't learn about any of that. You're falling down on that. Okay, thank you. We are officially at the end of our permitted time right now. So, is there a break right now? Yes, okay. Folks, you're on a break, and I want to thank our speakers for their wonderful comments.